This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and today I'm joined by Clara Cook. How are you doing, Clara? I'm good, Duncan. How are you doing? I'm not too bad um, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. I have to say, long-time listeners to Primitive Culture will know that when the two of us get together, <laughs> it's always a light, frothy, uh, cheery topic that we like to tackle. So tell the listeners, Clara, what is it we're looking at this time? Well, so today we're going to tackle um, the Nuremberg Trials and the sort of influence that that history has had on Star Trek and some of the themes that Star Trek uh, has addressed in certain episodes, primarily Deep Space Nine, of course, um, that actually echo the history of the Nuremberg trials and the echo, the sort of, I guess the questions about what happens when, you know, a conflict or a war has ended and who is responsible for any of the crimes that have been committed during that particular conflict or that war. I should say a little warning to our listeners that we will be talking about topics uh, that are war crimes and crimes against humanity. And some of those crimes are obviously quite upsetting, distressing um, crimes. So if you feel like this is not really something you want to hear today, maybe it's raining outside. I don't know. Maybe you've got stomach ache or a headache or something, and this is just going to be too depressing for you. Go and listen to one of our happier episodes and then come back to this when you're feeling more cheery. <laughs> Or maybe you're that lady at Destination Star Trek a few years ago who uh, kind of heckled us at our live panel for uh, presuming to talk about the Second World War at the Star Trek convention, which she thought was very much kind of not cricket. I think she didn't like the way we presented World War II as a negative thing. And unfortunately, world wars aren't a positive thing, no matter how you look at them. So... <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't they shouldn't be positive so yeah um but yeah it's it's not it isn't a particularly happy topic but it i would say that it's happy in the sense that i was quite impressed at how star trek tackles this topic that's a good thing hmm you know that's interesting okay um yeah and you you, you say the nuremberg trials i mean it's it's actually our kind of our our core text, I suppose, if you want to look at it, it that way. Um, it, it's the episode duet that I was uh, thinking of using as a kind of springboard. And the reference point for duet is not technically the Nuremberg Trials. The Nuremberg Trials happened sort of pretty much immediately after the Second World War. The reference point here, I think, is the Eichmann trial, which happened quite some time later, like maybe about 15-ish years afterwards, I think. Um, and in particular, a... Uh, well, I was going to say a fictionalised, it's, it's not a fictionalised version of the trial, a, a fictional story which takes its inspiration uh, from the Eichmann trial called The Man in the Glass Booth, uh, which was so-called because at his trial, Eichmann, who was a man who was responsible for a lot of the kind of logistics of um, transporting people to the concentration camps and so on. Um, so he was one of the kind of key uh, Nazis and he was discovered uh, in South America in the years after the war by um, the Israeli operatives uh, and then brought, kind of kidnapped, bundled into a plane, I think, and brought to Israel to face trial. And his trial, I think, is an interesting one because it's very much um, that the model is different to the Nuremberg model. For example, it's the first time that victims of the Holocaust are encouraged to testify. Uh, and there's an interesting aspect in Duet where there's this discussion about who's going to try this man. Is it, um, and Kira is saying, look, it has to be the Bajorans who get to try him basically because we're the, you know, we were the victims, essentially the victims are the ones who, who should be meeting out justice. I don't know whether there's a suggestion that the Federation could do it. In the Nuremberg trials, it was the Allies who kind of took on this responsibility as obviously participants in the war, but not as the victims for the most part of those war crimes that they were investigating. So I think that's kind of an interesting, um, question but the bigger parallel of course is this uh 
aspect of kind of mistaken identity, where which is where it all gets a little bit fanciful. And I was quite uh, shocked, to be honest, to discover that Duet was based on a play and a film uh, rather than being, I, I, I don't know, I, I'd watched that episode for decades and loved it and always thought it was one of the best DS9 episodes and had no idea that it was basically taking its central conceit from this film that I guess, you, you know, for the people who grew up and were writing DS9, maybe was something that they were more familiar with than I was. Yeah, I mean, I had no idea that it was um, sort of influenced by another story. I thought it was influenced very much by, you know, obviously the history, the Nazis, the Holocaust, the whole idea of what a war crime or as a crime against humanity is. And and also that people, sometimes people who are accused of crimes against humanity or war crimes, that they are actually two different things, although they're very intrinsically linked, that uh, they don't see themselves as having committed a crime. You know how uh, the the character in um, Maritza, who's in duet, who's the Cardassian that Kira believes is the actual uh, war criminal, it sort of says, you know, like th- this was this was policy. You know, this is this is the Cardassian policy. This was the policy of the of the, of the military of the occupation. There is that idea that some of these people who are accused at the time they believe what they were doing was well within the law. I mean, you could argue that crimes against humanity is a crime that's so big and so terrible and so um, against the concept of human rights that in any like society, in any part of history, it could, it could never be within the law. Uh, but individuals can say, well, I was acting on the policy of the, of the state or the policy of the government. Uh, so I thought it was more echoing that kind of history. I didn't realize it was actually echoing this play in this film, the man in the glass booth. And there's a twist in the glass booth, which I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll we're going to talk about a bit more, but which is that he's not actually a war criminal, which is the same twist in duet. It's, it's these two individuals for psychological reasons are taking on the guilt of other people, the people who really should mm. be tried. Um, it's, isn't it Colonel Dorf, Dorf, Dorf yeah. in the man, in the glass booth. And in duet, it's um, Gold da- Dahil, right? I think his mm. name is da- Dahil. And, they aren't those people but that they're taking on their identities in order to combat some of the guilt and the shame that they feel for the situation that they were in and in the case of um, duet it's it's maritza's trying to get the cardassians as a society to confront what they did to the bajorans during the occupation he thinks it's the only way that the that the the people of cardassia will progress and will basically heal um and mend mend bonds with mend broken bonds um with the Bajorans or at least forge some sort of relationship with the Bajorans in the future so that is interesting I think that's a kind of a complex idea because that sort of brings into question I mean there's a or I can also mention this a bit more but there's a great Netflix series called The Devil Next Door which is based on a true story Mm -hmm. And that's also a case of like, is this person really the person that he's being accused of being? Um, and that brings into question as well, like these trials are very emotive, you know, that the, the actual survivors of these terrible crimes are there. Uh, it's often many, many years later uh, that the, these eyewitness accounts are being given in court. If it's in a place like the Cardassians being tried on Bajor, or a war criminal is being tried in Israel, for instance, uh, a Nazi war criminal, then they're in a situation where everyone around them kind of wants them to be found guilty and wants to punish them. Which the Cardassians ought to be used to, you'd think, based on their justice system, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and also the, the Cardassians, I mean, sometimes with Deep Space Nine, it's a bit of a struggle for me to understand the time frame of things. Because... So they're sort of saying mm-hmm. these crimes happened very long ago, but we know that literally it's just like a year or two ago they left Deep Space Nine. So, but then of course the Cardassian. But they were there for like decades, right? So I think they were. weren't they there for like almost a hundred years or something? Mm. It was a long time. So, um, 
So there's a lot of people that will never be brought to justice for the occupation of Bajor, because if you think about 100 years of, or at least it's been like 60 years of occupation, then there's a lot of people that could have committed crimes in those in that period. So it's, 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 this, it's this weird sort of situation where it's not just about bringing war criminals to justice. It's also about how do you do it? And are you doing it in a just way? Um, or is this about vengeance? Or is it about the rule of law? Or is it about truth and reconciliation? Or is it about giving the victims some sense of like closure? I mean, can there ever be a sense of closure in that situation? Do you know what I mean? So it mixes all these different themes together. And funnily enough, um, when I was researching this topic, one of the first things that jumped up uh, on YouTube was an interview with Leonard Nimoy uh, when he was in a production of The Man in the Glass Booth. And he raised exactly all these questions. You know, what are these trials for? Uh, Are they about justice? Are they about punishing the guilty? Um, Are they about a kind of catharsis for you know the millions of people who've been uh affected by these things or victimized by these um policies or whatever and i suppose there's this kind of question of you know you try whoever you've got i mean there's a fascinating interview that you pointed me towards on hard talk the bbc um uh interview series with a guy who was one of the prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. And he talks about, you know, how they chose who they were going to try because they didn't try every German that they could, if you know what I mean. They, they selected kind of, um, I suppose people to sort of make examples of. And he kind of goes through the criteria and he says, well, the first, the most important thing is that you have them in custody because you can't try someone. Uh, I mean, you can try someone in absentia, but they, they, that's not what they were up to. Um, obviously with the Cardassians, uh, because they withdrew seemingly somewhat voluntarily from Bajor, it's not like the situation in Germany where, you know, the Allies, uh, stormed in and, and, and took the Germans prisoner and, you know, lots of them managed to kill themselves before they were taken prisoner and the ones that didn't ended up on trial. The, I'm talking about the kind of, you know, top Nazis, uh, at this point, the kind of the, the big shots. Um, you know, it's a very different situation. So Maritza Daril, if he were Gul Daril, there's this sort of question, you know, how would he ever, end up in Bajoran custody. And hence, he sort of has to, um, at the point in the episode where we're thinking it is Daryl, we sort of think, oh, well, this was a, a, this is a pretty major mistake he's made. And part of the way that his story kind of comes uh, apart is that it becomes evident that he basically put himself in that situation because he wanted um, to end up on Deep Space Nine. He wanted Kira to be uh, interrogating him. He, he, you know, he kind of engineered this situation. And I think it's kind of heavily implied in The Man in the Glass Booth that the same thing is happening. The whole sort of first half of that film, the character seems to be anxiously avoiding capture. But at the same time, the fact that he goes through this whole sort of uh, kind of performance suggests to me that he's it's quite ambiguous i suppose one thing i'd say about the movie um and i assume this is the case with the play as well although i haven't seen it is that it's left slightly unclear what is his motivation you know it's a very powerful performance it's a very disturbing strange film uh but it doesn't kind of give us any easy answers because there is obviously a kind of madness here ds9 episode i feel he does seem slightly mad but at the same time he also has a kind of rational justification for what he's doing and he explains it and at the end him and Kira can have a kind of uh calm and rational conversation about it and she can say she thought it was an honorable thing to do um and so on so I I think there's this kind of in the DS9 story they slightly make they make sense of it a little bit more albeit it's still quite an extraordinary thing for someone to do uh in that situation. But absolutely, he's, you know, he's saying we're all guilty. We all need, we need to be put on trial. And it's interesting. Um, another film that I watched in preparation for this is, um, an earlier film, Judgment at Nuremberg, which funnily enough also features the same actor, um, in a different role. And in this earlier film, he plays the, uh, defense attorney for the Nazis who've been put on trial. Um, one among a, a glittering cast, which includes uh, Marlena Dietrich, Judy Garland and Bill Shatner in a small but significant <laughs> role, which is, you know, many reasons to watch this interesting film. But one of the things that he says is that as the defence uh, attorney, 
he says basically he has to defend these men because it's not just these men that are on trial. The whole of German society is on trial. And if these men are found guilty, then we're all guilty, essentially. And I suppose that's very similar in some ways to what Maritza is saying, that, you know, even though I was just a filing clerk, uh, I'm still part of this kind of apparatus that means I'm responsible and I'm guilty for the crimes that have taken place. It's very different to, for example, the Cardassian in the Darkness and the Light, who is saying to Kira, you know, I was a servant, I folded shirts, this occupation was nothing to do with me. Okay, so I ended up on your planet, but that doesn't mean you had a right to, uh, it doesn't make me a legitimate target uh, in the terms that they're kind of discussing. So I suppose there are all these interesting questions, you know, what is justice? What What is the purpose of these kind of things? Where does responsibility ultimately rest? I mean, you know, as I say, a lot of the big Nazis by this point are long gone. Hitler is gone. Uh, You know, you could say all this stuff, does it go right the way up to the top? Um, But at the same time, does it then follow that anyone below that top level bears no responsibility for for what they do? Um, And so these are all definitely interesting questions that I think both these films and the DS9 episodes kind of um, get into one way or another. Yeah, and I think that, um, well, just to to reflect on a few things you said is, one of the things that you said about the... um, sort of giving a lesson to German society and it, it, that, that was one of the purpose purposes of the Nuremberg trials um, was not just to convict the defendants um, and to assemble you know evidence of war crimes um, but to make a judgment for history so that this could actually go down in history this is a record in history that this is what happened and these are the people that we are trying to um, prove out that they are these we're trying to prove that these are the people who are responsible for this 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 war or this crime or this series of crimes um but also to offer a lesson to the germans and i think the germans were in a very different situation at the end of world war ii than the cardassians are at the end of the occupation so cardassia as a planet there's no indication that cardassia as a planet is suffering post-occupation in the way that the germans were suffering post-world war ii so i mean like directly after world war ii so german society was you know still existed but like many of the major cities of germany were decimated um people were living in poverty you know whole things structures are broken down many people had died um there was women in germ in germany were like raped by russian soldiers i mean there was a whole load of stuff that was going on that was terrible in a similar situation as you could say japan was a mess after you know the um, atom bombs it was after world war ii on the firebombing of Tokyo. Or even, you know, in a DS9 uh, story context, it's it's Cardassia at the end of the series, not the beginning of the series. You know, that's the kind of analogue. Yes, but that's, end of the, that's the end of the Dominion War. Yeah, that's not... And there is no indication that they're going to take... They're going to prosecute the founders for crimes against humanity, and really, they should. Well, I don't think that's true. I, my memory of what you leave behind is that the female changeling hands herself in to face some kind of judgment... I mean, we never see it, but... Don't they all just go... Doesn't Odo go back to the... Yeah, Odo Odo goes back to the Great Link, but she she doesn't. And and I think it raises a really interesting question. I mean, given that she is clearly guilty of war crimes on a massive scale, and she, you know, she is the kind of Hitler, I suppose, of that story, or at least as far as we're concerned, we don't... Because the rest of the Link is a bit opaque and, and mysterious. Um, yeah, I think the very strong implication is that she's the one who's going to face the music. I mean... Okay, the Federation don't have the death penalty. The Klingons, I'm sure, have the death penalty. The Bajorans have the death penalty. I don't know. I think we kind of assume they're not going to execute her. Is she going to be imprisoned for life? And for a changeling, what does that mean? Is she, you know, this could be thousands of years that she's in a a Federation prison cell, potentially. Meanwhile, it's Odo who goes back to the Gamma Quadrant, you're right, and goes back to the Link. And he is the one who I think is sort of charged with, you know, in, in... post-World War II Germany, there was this idea of denazification. And I suppose the Nuremberg trials are partly about a kind of reckoning and a dealing with this in order to denazify the society. Uh, you know, is Odo going into the link at the end of what you leave behind an attempt at kind of beginning that process somehow at bringing the link round, um, at dismantling whatever kind of, uh, ideas, attitudes, you know, all these prejudices and so on that have kind of led to uh, the Dominion War. I don't know. It, it, I think it's an interesting question. And of course, we don't know because 
other than I'm sure it's covered in the novels, but, you know, as far as canon uh, Star Trek is concerned, th- there's nothing really beyond that to tell us what happened next. I think the problem with that is the the, the, the they make a big emphasis throughout the show that the link is this communal race, right? So, this, so they're all responsible. They're all making the decision together. And I mean, that, that comes to the question of a just war, right? So the... The whole concept of a just war, there's this just war theory and war crimes are born out of the just war theory, which is the idea that when you commit a war crime, and one of those would be crime of aggression, which is a crime against peace. So that's the planning, initiation, execution of a large scale and serious acts of aggression using state military force. So that would be annexing um, a part of, of a country that, you know, that you don't have permission to do. That would be invading another person's country, military occupation, so the occupation of Bajor, um, bombardment, military blockades of ports, so you know that you're going to starve a population, that kind of thing. That is like, well, you're not waging a war in a just way. Now, me, personally, I would be like, can there ever be a just war? But there is a theory, and the theory is, um, it's like connected to the doctrine of military ethics, that a war has to be morally justifiable, so you have to have the right to go to war. And yet then it also, you have to conduct yourself correctly when at war. So a just cause would be like innocent life is an imminent danger and it's intervention is need to, needed to protect that life. So your ally, right, is being invaded by another country. And as you are the ally of the invaded country, you think that their population is an imminent danger, then you declaring war would be considered a just action when it comes to war. You're defending the 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 life that has an imminent threat against it. So I guess the Dominion could say, or at least the founders could say, you know, we thought that we were under imminent threat from the solids. Now I don't agree with that, but they did do that whole thing, didn't they? They they they, they said it as they did that whole test, the mind test thing, didn't they? With the with the main DS9 crew, didn't they kind of go into their minds and see how they would react? And they... Right, yeah. Yeah, and so they determined that the solids in the Alpha Quadrant were um, basically a threat to to changelings. And that's... So I think, at least in the, change, in the changelings' minds, they probably think they're waging a just war, you know? But they're not the winners, of the war. <laughs> they're not the, the victors. So they're going to have to abide by Federation Federation rules and Federation law. And I guess the whole just war theory fits as well with the Bajorans too. So, and this is addressed again and again, lots of the different Deep Space Nine episodes. I mean, so many Deep Space Nine episodes I watched for this, <laughs> for this podcast, all of the, all of them involving Kira and her involvement um, with the terrorist um, Shakar cell. Um, Basically, she's questioned again and again throughout the series, and she questions herself that the things that she did during the occupation um, as a terrorist, whether they were just, you know. But there's also shown in the series that she didn't really have much choice. It wasn't like the Cardassians were ever going to leave. It wasn't their planet. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't their society. They were subjugating and enslaving the Bajorans, and that would be a crime against humanity, not just a war crime. Um so there is this question of like is violence in any of these situations just and with Kira you know she 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 knows she's killed civilians she's killed Cardassians that weren't in the military and weren't military targets she knows she's done that and killing civilians even in a war is considered a war crime you're not supposed to kill civilians because they aren't combatants they haven't signed up to be part of this conflict they are just happened to be caught in the middle of it and so that's also another question is like if the occupation had gone another way and the Cardassians had control over everything, would it be Kira who's in the dock? I'm not sure they'd even bother with a trial, to be honest. No, they would probably <laughs> just execute her. But like, what if Kira, like, it, that, then you say, well, what about if she's a member of the Maquis? You know, I mean, like, it's a little bit like if, if she was fighting against the Federation and the Federation had been, I don't know. I mean, that's what the Maquis are doing. They call themselves freedom fighters, don't they? So it's a bit different when it's crimes against humanity, I guess. A war crime, like accidentally killing some civilians, is one thing. But a crime against humanity, it's like the systematic 
oppression and um, a mass slaughter of a, of, a, of a group of people, you could never justify that. That's a crime against humanity. So no matter what happens or what situation you're in, no matter who tells you it's legal at the time, no matter how you ordered it, like by who, whoever, who, by who to do it, um, that's never going to be legi- legally justifiable uh, or morally justifiable. I think um, Chancellor uh, Gorkon's daughter might have an issue with the concept of crimes against humanity. But you're right; it's 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 definitely it, you know the, the crimes that the Cardassians are accused of are different. I think in various ways to the crimes that the resistance could be accused of. I mean, you call them terrorists. I'm sure Kira would call them freedom fighters. Uh, I think there's a kind of interesting question: Is the model for the Bajoran resistance the French resistance? Uh, or is it as there are just little hints of in some of these stories when you start thinking of it in terms of Eichmann and so on? Is it Mossad, which is a very different kind of organisation? I don't know if it's the French Resistance. That there is definitely uh, parts of, of Deep Space Nine where they explain that the Shakar Resistance cell did kill like children. You know, they put a bomb in the house of one of the Cardassian generals, and it kills like 20 Cardassians, including his family, which are like his wife and children who are just on, and she says, well, they were on Bajor. They didn't, they shouldn't have been on Bajor. But I mean, like a Cardassian child of a, of a general, like, do they have a choice? Do you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's not, it's not clear cut. It's shades of grey. And I think it's interesting in that episode, Kira is quite unapologetic about it. She's, you know, the Cardassian is there. He's showing off his, his scarred face and so on. And she's kind of like, yeah, what do you want? You know, what you, you're expecting sympathy from me, are you? Uh, you know, she's quite kind of, uh, strong. She's quite sort of unbending about it, if you know what I mean. She's, there's, there's not really any big soul searching question for her. It's, it's pretty black and white as far as she's concerned. Um, and I just think it's interesting, you know, how do we characterize the resistance, because obviously, you know, the French resistance, we kind of romanticise uh, to a large extent. I think the Bajoran resistance, generally, we kind of see uh, in that light. And they seem like, you know, she's got her old chums from the resistance who seem like quite fun. Uh, uh, they're, they're not kind of nasty terrorists. They, they they seem like decent people, if you know what I mean. But I think there are these kind of interesting questions. And in that episode, there's an interesting line. The reason I mentioned Mossad, the, the thing that made me think of that, is that... Um, Pharrell and Lupasa, when they arrive on the station, uh, these are her old resistance comrades, they say to Kira, just give us the name of whoever this is and we'll take care of it, basically. Uh, in other words, you know, there's not going to be a, an arrest. There's not going to be a trial. We'll just go out and do a hit on this person and, and deal with this problem. And she says, you know, oh, it's not like the old days. We can't just send out an assassination squad. Again, th- to me, this sort of invokes a slightly different model. I don't know. And it, and it, it did make me think, you know, watching these episodes, uh, looking at the situation with the Eichmann trial and the man in the glass booth and so on, um, and thinking of the Bajorans not just as representing the Jews in Europe, but also that Bajor post-occupation in some ways has echoes of Israel post-World War II. I thought that was an interesting parallel that kind of comes through that way. Yeah, definitely. I think that's defi- definitely like a parallel I think, and I think they did that deliberately, didn't they? Like that the the and the Bajoran society has to learn, just like Kira has to learn, to understand how much more complex like truth and reconciliation is. How, how much more complex the situation is after a, a conflict like this. This isn't to say like we're not apologists for like <laughs> for Nazis, okay? Like this isn't to say that you know the Holocaust is a situation where um, it is a piece of part of history where like we're not questioning that the Holocaust happened or anything like that. Do not worry. But it's more that um, just how responsible are people and what can you what kind of crime can you accuse them with? And you know, in the case of um, this this documentary series, uh, The Devil Next Door, which I would recommend definitely. There's this uh, auto worker, American auto worker, retired auto worker, who he's, de- he's dead now. But um, when they found him, he was living in Cleveland and he was accused of being a German Nazi prison camp guard. And he was accused of being a, a specific prison guard. So Ivan the Terrible was his was his um, nickname because he was such a sadistic prison guard. Um, and, you know, he, there were eyewitness accounts. There were people who had been 
victims of his who had survived the Holocaust, who could give witness to who he was. And he was extradited from America to Israel in 1986 for a highly, I would say, publicized, incredibly, like, like a televised, incredibly well covered um, trial. So, you know, there was like do- oh, journalists covering it. It was like a daily, uh, like a daily updates in the news. And it was almost like a 24 news cycle, even in the 80s before 24 news cycles really happened the way they do now. And crowds of people would gather outside the courtroom every day. Um, the courtroom was filled um, with people. There were these highly distressing, um, emotive testimonies given by survivors and eyewitnesses. And at the time as well, his American citizenship was revoked. And it could not be established without doubt um, that he was Ivan the Terrible. But it was established that he was at the Sobibor extermination camp in Poland. And he was at several other death camps, basically. And that he had sort of hidden that, you know, and he had moved to America and never told anybody, really. Um, I guess he must have said he, you know, he had been in the war and everything. And they knew he was an immigrant to America. But he, you know, he'd kind of hidden that part of his past. And the documentary covers almost everyone's point of view. It's very good. It covers the victims, the Holocaust survivors. Um, it covers his family. So you see and hear from his um, his son, I think it is, and his grandson are talking about, or maybe it's his, his daughter and his grandson, talking about almost kind of sort of trying to justify what he was doing. Like, you know, you don't know what situation you were in at the time. It's war. You have to do what you have to do to survive. Like saying stuff like that, trying to justify his actions. And the interesting thing about it was they couldn't get, they can't get him on war crimes because he wasn't the person who came up with the Holocaust. He didn't design it. He wasn't giving the orders for executions or torture or abuse. And they also couldn't, it didn't feel like they could get him on human rights, you know, crimes against humanity because they couldn't clearly without like, um, reasonable doubt right they, but couldn't completely get rid of reasonable doubt in determining that he was the exact person that had done these things specifically even with all the eyewitness testimony um, because it was many years later that people were testifying you know uh, and at the time obviously there was the Soviet Union and so a lot of the records about him were kept in the Soviet Union um, and they didn't have access to them. And then once obviously the Soviet Union fell, their records became available and they found out a lot more information about him, about where he, all the death camps he'd been an officer at and stuff. So then he was extradited to a Germany and they actually managed to convict him on a different crime. They convicted him on accessory to murder. That an accessory is a person who assists him, but does not actually participate in the commission of a crime. So he's not commissioning the crime. He's not saying let's go murder these people, but he's assisting in it. And this opened a whole new sphere in Germany for prosecuting people, Nazis. Because if you can't get them as the design designers and architects of the Holocaust, and you can't get them for like specifically murdering somebody, you can get them for being in the location. You know, they were an officer at a death camp, which means they saw what was happening. They saw people being murdered. And whether they took part in it or not, we cannot prove necessarily but they were there and they were part of the machine. So they're an accessory. So he was convicted of um, an accessory to 27,900 counts of murder and uh, was imprisoned, basically. He was sent to prison, mm. sentenced. He was only sentenced for five years, but he was so old at that point that he died in prison. And because of the fact that that sort of set a precedent in German law, and this is a situation where the Germans are prosecuting him, not, not the Israelis. It meant that the German authorities could go out and could start prosecuting other ex-Nazis or other ex, you know, um, camp guards and camp um, facilitators and stuff or whatever they would call themselves um, under the the idea that you know you're an accessory, you're part of the machine, you played a part even if it you didn't orchestrate it or give the order, and that's quite a big deal because. You could probably get a lot of Cardassians under that, couldn't you? But only if you could get them. That's the that's the the thing, isn't it? Is they're not available, I suppose. And that's the that was the key issue. Uh, you know, at Nuremberg was who did they have available and who had escaped? And you know, Eichmann was one of those who'd gone to South America and, and disappeared. And it took you know over a decade to 
find that person. So I suppose, and I guess that's why you get all these stories uh, of these, you, you know, the Nazi living next door in America or whatever. There is this kind of fascination with these stories of these guys who've sort of gone to ground, you know, where are they? Um, and this, and this kind of issue of identity. I mean, we had it with the um, Serbian guy who was hiding out as an osteopath, wasn't he? And then, and then was, was captured and eventually uh, put on trial, I think. But, you, you know, I suppose you do have these situations where people can create a new identity and disappear. So that, so there are, I suppose, um, I mean, these days with like genetic testing and so on, maybe it's easier to establish someone's identity. But it, I think it's interesting that a lot of these stories that we're talking about, the man in the glass booth, duet, etc., uh, the question of identity is central. I, in reality, in both the Nuremberg trials and the Eichmann trials, certainly this idea of what was known as the Nuremberg defence was the key uh, argument being made. It wasn't, oh, I'm not who you say I am. It was precisely as you suggested earlier, uh, I was just following orders. You know, it wasn't, it, the responsibility uh, goes higher up. So Eichmann could say, well, yes, I knew that uh, the people I was transporting to the concentration camps were going to be killed, but I wasn't the one killing them. And someone else just told me these people have to get to this place. And my job was just to make sure it happened. Um, I was doing, you know, I was doing my job. I wasn't responsible for the system and for the kind of machine that I was, as you say, a kind of part of. I saw a really interesting documentary about um, the Eichmann trial where they interviewed uh, Rommel's son, I think, Rommel, one of the German generals, uh, and they were talking to him about, you, you know, what kind of responsibility uh, individual Germans could be said to have. And he made an interesting point, I thought, which was that he said, well, if you were so uh, violently opposed to what you were being asked to do, um, his argument was you, you could volunteer for a different, you could volunteer to be sent out to the front. You could, if you had said, look, I don't feel comfortable working in this concentration camp or whatever it is, please just send me out to the front lines to fight the Russians. He was basically saying, you know, they, they would, they would have accepted that. Um, and, and you would probably have been killed on the Russian front, but at least your conscience would have been clean. So that was his kind of argument was that you could volunteer for something that, you know, might be not far away from suicide but at the same time you, or you could commit suicide frankly you know rather than do some of these horrific things so i suppose there are these kind of interesting questions and with the the nuremberg trials and with the eichmann trial there was this big question that was leveled at the jews of how much agency they had or didn't have why didn't they do more how did they you know there was I mean, it's, it seems strange in a way from our perspective, but at the time, I think there was a real uh, sort of ambivalence and discomfort, uh, certainly in Israel, about this question of, you know, why did the Jews not fight back more? Do you know what I mean? They outnumbered the Germans. Okay, the Germans had guns. Why didn't they try to fight more? They kind of seemed to be like lambs to the slaughter sort of thing. And they had to really kind of dismantle this idea that uh, that the Jews had more power in some ways than they than they did, or at least this kind of question of, of, you know, how much agency they had in that situation. With the Germans, it's sort of, it's almost the mirror image of that. It's this question of, you know, individually, uh, do you have the agency to not participate in this awful thing that you've kind of been wrapped up in? It is the argument that you were just following orders, a legitimate argument. And I think the answer from Nuremberg is that it's not, that, you know, the Nuremberg defence is not a valid excuse uh, for otherwise criminal behaviour. Um, but it is very much what we hear over and over and over again. And even in the DS9 episode, Waltz, Descartes basically plays the Nuremberg uh, card. Or, or Cisco rather kind of plays it for him. He says, you know, you were just following orders, weren't you? Kind of leading him. And he's like, yes, exactly. You know, I wanted to be more moderate. The orders coming down from above were telling me to execute more people. Uh, you know, what was I supposed to do? Someone else would have done it and it would have been worse if, if it hadn't been me. So it's this kind of, I suppose it's, it's an interesting nexus of these kind of legal questions, moral questions, personal questions, and one of the things that is quite interesting about the Eichmann trial is they try to ask him at various points what he, 
how he saw certain things and what he thought about them. Did, you know, when he witnessed the death of Jews, did he consider it murder or not? And he won't answer these questions. He's very evasive about it. And at one point he says, um, he says, I shall not reveal my innermost feelings. That's the line that he gives. And he says, basically, these are matters of conscience and someone's own conscience is their own private affair. And you don't have the right to pry into what I thought was right and wrong. So it's this really um, strange situation where, you know, here's someone who's being accused of these monstrous, terrible things that he was wrapped up in and participated in. Um, and he's sort of just saying, look, what, what I felt about them goes to the grave with me. Uh, you know, no one else is going to find out um, what my inner uh, relationship to that situation was. It's interesting. So some of the things that you, one of the things you said about, um, well, several things. One of the things you said about the idea of like the Jews fighting back and, or not fighting back and passively walking to their deaths or whatever. Um, well, I, I've always found that a really weird argument for people to make because I think, you know, a lot of the time <laughs> people think, well, why wouldn't you fight back? Well, this whole like, people do very different things when they're threatened or when they find themselves um, threatened with violence or in a very frightening situation. The first response isn't always to fight, you know. Um, and also, the, we're talking about great swathes of civilians. We're not talking about people who have military training or have trained to fight we're talking about the average everyday person you know who's not like violent you know what I mean? it's just this idea that you know a whole bunch of people who have all sorts of different professions you know like a grocer or a teacher or a chemist or all these do you know what I mean is going to suddenly get together and get some guns and start do you know what I mean I, I just I think in a situation where you're your, and also there's a lot of like not always believing what's happening and understanding what's happening. It, these, it, these things happen very, happened very slowly over time, at least initially with the, you know, the laws restricting Jews from doing certain things. You know, first of all, you couldn't, I don't know, go this particular place and then you couldn't sell this and then you couldn't go to a swimming pool and then you couldn't blah, blah, blah. And then eventually you had to wear a yellow star. It's happening over time. It wasn't like they suddenly woke up and, you know, they were being abducted in the middle of the night, although it did end up being that towards the end. But you know, there's, there's, it's like this breaking down and um, dehumanizing of a population over time, um, so that they're so traumatized that they can't really understand what's happening to them, um, and they have no agency. I, I just feel like blaming the Jews is, is a really anti-Semitic thing for someone to do. Do you know what I mean? But interestingly, it was other Jews who were apparently who were doing it at the time. It was it, then there was a real tension between the Jews who kind of had had survived the camps and and the others in Israel. I mean, I didn't know any of this. This was fascinating to me that there was this sort of shame of like you know, uh, or, or a sort of it, th that's why it took all that time to get to the point even where these testimonies were being recorded and why the Eichmann trial was so important was that in the immediate aftermath of the war, they didn't really, people didn't talk about it. You know, there was this sense of this is that there's something to be ashamed of, uh, even as the victims of this monumental crime, um, let alone as the perpetrators of it. Well, I think that ties very neatly into the man of the glass booth because he is very he's quite anti-semitic throughout most of it um and obviously the first half he's a jew who's anti-semitic and the second half he's posing as a nazi who's anti-semitic but he it's almost like he feels shame for the fact that he survived but also shame for the fact that his father didn't survive his father didn't fight back his father didn't work hard enough you know like um the the the, the people around him weren't as strong as him they didn't or as lucky, you know, I think there's some indication in the story that he was possibly collaborating at certain points, that he may have been one of the Jews that was sort of forced into collaborating to survive. The other thing also about actively resisting, and I think this is an interesting thing, because you don't have to... It's true that actively resisting in a totalitarian state or in a state of, of oppression would be probably a very dangerous thing to do uh you could possibly lose your life you could definitely lose i mean and definitely lose a job definitely lose your home um you could definitely be put in danger your family could be put in danger but there's a there's a very good film called downfall which is about the last 
the last few months of Hitler's life in in the bun- in the bunker that he was living in with some of the top Nazis um, in Berlin, where as 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 he was losing the war, and it's told kind of from the point of view of one of his secretaries, Trouty Young, and you know it, it, it goes through the whole story and everything, and obviously ends with him his death and ends with the um, the fall of like Berlin, like Berlin being. Um, everybody surrendering in Berlin falling and there's an actress that plays Trouty Young obviously they're all actors but at the very end of the film they have a small clip of the actual Trouty Young herself talking and she sort of talks about like ignorance and youth and she sort of says like um she says I was 22 and I didn't know anything about politics it didn't really interest me she just said I admitted that you know, she she says, I just felt like I was very young, you know, and at the time I was so young, I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't really understand. Um, and I didn't really know exactly. She kind of admired Adolf Hitler, but she didn't really know who she was working for properly. I mean, she was there like typing out stuff that he was saying, like she was in contact with him quite a lot. But she said that she was using her, her youth as an excuse. And she said, you know, one day I walked past this monument to Sophie Scholl, who, um, or skull, depending on how you say it, um, who was this young um, woman, German woman, who stood up against the Nazis and was actually executed. And she said, I looked at her and realised that she'd been the same age as me. And I, then I stopped using my youth as an excuse because my naivety, my innocence, my ignorance as an excuse. It's not an excuse. I, I should have known what I was doing. I should have known who I was working for. And that being young wasn't an excuse because here was this other young woman who had also been young but had bothered to make a stand and yes she lost her life you know so I don't know if like not resisting is an excuse and it waltz in a similar way to um even in duet like some of the stuff that comes out it's more than just following orders it's more than just like um I was doing my best in a bad situation or I had to survive um, in a terrible situation. You know, I, I didn't have any choice. It comes out because eventually Ducat starts talking about how he hates the Bajorans. It even says, like, doesn't even say something like, you know, their wrinkle, I hate their wrinkled noses. He starts talking about their physical appearance, which is one of the signs of someone who is actually like a racist, right? And, and, and even in Duet, they mention it too. Like even Odo, he says something like his smug Cardassian pride and Kira says oh there's you know his horrible Cardassian smile it's like when the two different sides start referring to each other in these like really do you know what I mean like just like generalizing blanket terms like all Cardassians are bad or in the case of Waltz he just he you know all the Bajorans are so lazy with their superstitions and their you know, he, he starts referring to him as as if uh, it's basically dehumanizing somebody. It's making them out to be this thing rather than a person or a people. It's making them into being like just a sort of an idea that you can squash. Or in the case of a, d- a description, like their wrinkled noses or they're so tall, or it's making them into something that you can you can eradicate. It's easier to eradicate because you've dehumanized them. And Maritza as Daryl uh, does the same thing. I think there's this kind of contempt. For the Bajorans, the way that he talks to Kira, uh, he, you know, he's very similar. I mean, just to be clear, uh, the, the fact that uh, Descartes plays the Nuremberg card, like almost everything that comes out of his mouth is bullshit. <laughs> you know, like ev- everything that Descartes says up until the final point in that episode, maybe is, is, you know, he, he's, He's a liar. He's a fantasist. He's he's someone whose word can't be trusted at all. I mean, actually, you mentioned conspiracy theories earlier. Um, both Descartes and Maritza slash Daryl uh, basically peddle conspiracy theories. Uh, they play this card. You know, there are various cards that the kind of Nazi slash Cardassian defendant can play. One of them is this idea uh, that, you know, Oh, atrocities! What atrocities? No, those things never happened. No, that was a myth. I mean, that Maritza as Daryl uh, claims that that some of these atrocities were uh, inventions that were put out just to scare the Bajorans, and they never actually did them. Descartes uses this phrase. He refers to them as alleged improprieties. You know, sort of using this kind of euphemism to get around the fact that these were appalling 
uh, atrocities and war crimes. Um, so there is that kind of attempt to kind of say, no, these things never happened. Um, there's also, as you say, this kind of defense of, oh, we didn't know what was happening. That's kind of harder for de Kupp to play, but a lot of Germans, uh, would, would go down that route. And it raises this really difficult question, I think when you think of it in terms of this idea of a whole society being on trial, who did and didn't know what was going on in these camps? You know, were they successfully keeping their existence from German civilians, even from other German soldiers? I don't know. And uh, interestingly, that film Judgment at Nuremberg is very concerned with that because the, the judge in question, the American judge, gets friendly with the German lady played by Marlena Dietrich. Uh, and it, th- there's this real kind of, desire on his part to sort of get to the bottom of uh who knew what and she sort of says to him you know you surely you don't think we knew about this you you know you've met me you know what sort of person i am you know you know i wouldn't be okay with this sort of thing i just didn't know it was happening and there's this kind of real uncertainty you know can he believe her um or not i think the interesting thing um when it came to eichmann is eichmann didn't for the most part claim not to know about things. I mean, to some extent, he, he sort of said, well, I was dealing with my own limited area and other stuff was kind of beyond my remit. What comes across really strongly when you look at the Eichmann trial is he just didn't seem to care about it. Um, so e- even something that sort of maybe in theory he might recognize was wrong or that there would, there would be a kind of awareness or an issue about, he just seems very cool and sort of uninterested. Um, there's none of that, at least on the surface, that kind of violent racism, that kind of hatred, uh, that sort of bigotry, it just seems to be a kind of complete indifference to suffering and to the humanity of other people. And this kind of, um, I don't know, I think that's one of the things that's so chilling about him. And it is quite chilling for the most part about the Cardassians is that they have this quite cool, I mean, if you think of Descartes, okay, at the end of Waltz, he's ranting and raving, but that is not the Descartes that we normally get. We normally get this very composed, very slick kind of political, um, unmoved character somehow. And that's one of the things that's so chilling about the Cardassians is that they, uh, they're not rage filled monsters. They, they're quite cool and calculating and, um, thoughtful and, and kind of, um, deliberate. Yeah, yeah, in Ties of Blood and Water, which is um, the DS9 episode where Takeni Gamor, who is the father of the Cardassian woman that Kira is sort of um, surgically altered to look like. And in, obviously in the series, we never find out what happened to her. Although I think in the novels, she does feature or we find out what happened to her. But it, it, in the canon series, we never find out what happened to her. So Takeni Gamor and Kira kind of develop this very um, close relationship because Kira is the closest thing that Takeni has, like emotionally, um, to a daughter. And Kira obviously wasn't present for her father's death and uh, her father is dead and doesn't she doesn't have any biological family. So um, she attaches herself to Gamor and cares about him. And so in Ties of Blood and Water, Gamor comes to the station, he's dying, and Kira is very close to him. There's a really good scene in this episode, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes, where Ducat, just completely separate going on a tangent here, Ducat walks into Kira's quarters and says, sorry to disturb you, Major. And Kira says, sorry enough to leave? <laughs> and the way she says it... And then throws I, something at him, right? She throws she, a she cup chucks. at him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, you know what? That's just that's a perfect answer to Ducat ending, entering any room, just because he's horrible. But, um, mm. but she... So she's de- she, you know, she's developed this bond with Takeni, and so she's um, Takeni Gamor, and so she's with him while he's dying. And then Ducat brings us this information that he was at this uh, site of this um, monastery. There was a massacre of a monastery where all these monks were assassinated or killed. Mass- I should say massacred um, by Cardassian soldiers. It was it's a, it's a war crime, and it happened during the occupation. And she doesn't feel like she can sit with Takeni anymore. She doesn't feel like she can comfort him. And she confronts him. And he says, I feel terrible about that. We were wrong. We were so wrong. Um, but I was I, I was with my friends and I thought these people had killed my friends and we were all in the army together. He says it better than this, I'm paraphrasing. 
But he makes it clear that he regrets everything that happened during the occupation. And later on, Sakira basically says, you know, you can't make excuses for this. I'm, you know, I'm going to basically disown you. I'm leaving. You can die on your own. Um, And later on, she's sort of sitting there uh, feeling down. And Odo speaks to her and he says, I looked up his record. Like, Odo checks everyone out. You know, he checks everyone out, right? And he says, he says, you know, he was 19 when this happened. He was one of 400 soldiers at this monastery. You don't even know if he fired his gun. Like, it's quite possible that he wasn't, you know, and he'd, he'd been in the army for like three months or something. Like, he, this wasn't a man who was going around orchestrating war crimes. This was a soldier in, in a wartime situation. I, I mean, was it war? It's an occupation. But, you know, he was a soldier um, and his job was to be a soldier and he was in this location, but we don't know if he actually was, like, killing anyone. Um, and especially saying that to Kira, who we know has been a member of a terrorist cell or has been a member of a freedom fighter group, depending on how you look at it, um, who also has been in situations where people have died and has kind of been directly and indirectly responsible. So... I thought that was really interesting because that is sort of addressing the whole of Cardassian society, kind of. So Kenny Gamore is the good Cardassian. We like to Kenny Gamore, right? Because he's kind and he's nice and he's in opposition to the Dominion government, the puppet Dominion Cardassian government. He's in favour of building relationship with the Federation. He's forged a you know, close relationship with our favourite Bajoran, right? Who's Kira, the character we've followed since season one. As the audience, we like him. But DS9 makes us aware it's not allowed not allowing us to forget that all Cardassians were somehow involved in the occupation even if they weren't directly involved or they didn't they won on they won on Bajor maybe they stayed on the Cardassian homeworld they're part of the society that occupied subjugated and decimated another society it's a collective responsibility it's a collective guilt that people have to fear have to feel in order to be able to develop and evolve as a society in order to be able to move along like it's truth and reconciliation you can't just say i was there but i you know like i don't think people who were alive during world war ii and in the during the time of the holocaust in germany can say i didn't know anything because or just act like i'm not responsible I think there has to be a sense of like collective cultural recognizing recognizing that this is what happened in our country and this is what we did. Like, even if we weren't personally responsible, because then how do you move on? It's like asking the British to recognize that they were involved in the slave trade. You know, it, 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 did were you personally involved? No, you weren't alive at the time. But recognizing that your culture, um, your society, you know, has that history. Um, that maybe that you're here you are because your ancestors had a choice, whereas other people are where they are because their ancestors didn't have a choice. But it's interesting because that's another example that is uh, maybe not controversial for you or me, but, you know, is a hot issue for other people. I mean, not everyone in Britain would take the same position on on something like that. Do you know what I mean? And this question of, like, how much responsibility can you be expected to bear or how much guilt can you be expected to carry uh, for actions that you didn't participate in personally? Uh, I I think it's an interesting one. And actually, you know, the German civilians who, you know, uh, never were within sight of a concentration camp, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's also an interesting question. I think there's there's another interesting link between um, Ties of Blood and Water and Duet, though, Um, quite apart from the fact that actually... Uh, to Kenny Gamore is played by Lawrence Pressman, who is also in the Man in the Glass Booth, plays the kind of young assistant of the of the central. <laughs> it's character. all connected. <laughs> it's it's all connected, yeah. Um, but it, there's this question of you know, is it is it damning enough that he was at this monastery, even as Odo says, without knowing what he did there, whether he fired his weapon, whether he was involved, uh, you, you know, without knowing any of the context? Is it just the fact that he was there enough to kind of damn him? Now, in Duet, the argument that Kira makes at the beginning of the episode, uh, when they think they've just got Armin Maritza, the filing clerk, is the fact that he was at this camp where such terrible things happened that's enough. You know, he was there, therefore he's responsible. He should be tried. No one involved in this camp has ever been brought to justice because they're all 
off on Cardassia or whatever and, and outside the reach of Bajoran uh, intelligence or whatever. Um, this is someone who was there and he can be held responsible. By the end of the episode, she's come around to the idea that, yes, he was there, but he was actually cowering in his room, crying at night, uh, feeling terrible about the awful things that were going on and powerless to do anything about it. Uh, and therefore, you know, she doesn't feel that he should be uh, seen as guilty or punished for for being in that situation. So I think it, it, that both those episodes sort of raise this question in different ways. You, you know, is is it enough to just say that someone was present when a, a an atrocity was committed? Somewhat in the same way as you say, like as an accessory to murder. I mean, you get that in some ways, don't you? You know, if you're I don't know, if you're in a gang and someone in the gang kills someone, are you, do you know what I mean? What, what level of responsibility do you bear if you didn't actually physically uh, do anything to injure them? I th- you know, the, these, again, kind of interesting legal questions, but also interesting moral questions that it raises. I guess the thing is, maybe legally you can't be to blame, right? And maybe legally you shouldn't be prosecuted, you know? Maybe there isn't a legal case, but maybe there's a moral one. Well, I think there like- is a legal case in those situations, Um but I think about Maritza and Takeni is that both of them feel some sort of, um, they recognise that the situation was not right, right? And in the case of um, other people, shall we say, is their complete willingness to acknowledge that the situation isn't right. Like, um, So, f- for instance, my ancestors, <laughs> my great-grandfather was a victim uh, he, his whole family were murdered in the Armenian genocide, right? So, I mean, and as we know, the Armenian genocide was perpetrated by the, the Turks. Now, am I going to reject the hand of friendship from a Turkish person? No. Am I not going to go to a Turkish restaurant? No. Am I never going to visit Turkey? No. I don't hold people who are Turkish responsible now. I don't hold indiv- Turkish individuals responsible for the genocide, just like I am not a direct victim of the genocide myself. It's just a family history, right? But it would be nice if Turkey acknowledged, like as a country, as a society, that it was a genocide. They refused to acknowledge that it was a genocide, right? And, you know, I mean, we're talking about millions of Armenians. They didn't just disappear off the face of the earth because they, I don't know, decided to go somewhere else. This isn't like some accident. It's it's a genocide, right? And so it's nice when, like whole countries or communities recognize the history and acknowledge the history because the only way you're ever going to learn from history is if you acknowledge your part in it it's like why we have holocaust memorial day it's so we can remember and it's so that we can like learn about it so that we don't repeat it and in the case of you know Dukat is Dukat's never gonna i mean Dukat is actually responsible he is actually responsible right we know he is but like He's never going to acknowledge it. He's never going to accept it. And if Cardassia never accepts that they occupied and, you know, subjugated and cruelly destroyed Bajor and the Bajoran people, then Cardassia can never be part of the Federation. They can't progress as a society. They can't progress as a world. And also, um, it, that sort of occupation could happen again and again and again throughout the galaxy. Then it, you know. Then what's to stop the Dominion from doing whatever they want? Which of course they did. What's to stop the Klingons or the Romulans or do you know what I mean? Then it's like, well, all right, let's go occupy a whole bunch of worlds. Like it's it's do you know what I mean? It's, there has to be some level of like understanding the history and accepting that your country had played a part in it, even if you personally are not responsible. It's not like people should reject you because you're I don't know German or something, but that they. It, you know, you should learn about it in school. You should understand it's part of your heritage. Just like Britain should understand that they had an empire. You know, it's not... Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't feel person- personally responsible for the British Empire, but I understand that it's part of the hitch history of of me being a British person. Um, do you know what I mean? You can see that every time you go to a museum um, in Britain, like the v and or the British Museum. Um, those artefacts didn't just happen to appear there suddenly by magic. They were brought there through... Lots of different ways. One of those ways was conquest. So um, I think that's part of the problem that the Cardassians are facing is that they have kind of refused, some of them, not all of them, but many of them in the series seem to be refusing, in the franchise, seem to be refusing to accept 
that the occupation really was an occupation and that people really suffered. They, because like Ducat, I think some of them still believe they're superior as a, as a species to Bejo. And I don't know, I don't think the Cardassians are going to ever get anywhere if they think themselves superior to other species. That's like, you know, <laughs> a big warning sign right there. So they can't become part of the Federation if they think they're superior to everybody else. And they don't want to be part of the Federation at that point. Although, interestingly, of but course, they in future, will later. Star Trek, at, some, at <laughs> some point they will, as we know, because there's a Cardassian Federation president. Uh, although, obviously, she it doesn't necessarily mean that Cardassia is part of the Federation, though I think we see that they are on one of those flags or whatever. But yes, I think, you, you know, in the period that Deep Space Nine is, is taking place in, they're very much in the mode of uh, sort of nothing to see here. You know, they got away with it, basically. They left Bajor. Uh, no one really called them to account while the occupation was happening. The Federation certainly didn't get involved, though presumably they may have known something about what was going on there. I don't know. That's a whole big... That's like, like another podcast. Open, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, you, you know, and then they left and they were, for the most part, beyond the possibility of prosecution, apart from presumably a handful of Cardassians who happened to be captured by the resistance or whatever and could be kind of put on trial. And we understand executed because the Bajorans execute uh, prisoners in this situation after the occupation. But for the most part, they got away with it. Um and I think really it's only that the reckoning kind of comes after we imagine after the Dominion War, when Cardassia is brought to its knees, when they suffer horrifically themselves, just as the Germans suffered in the Second World War, um, you know, in the latter period of that war in particular, uh, when, you know, Cardassia Prime is brought to the level of Berlin in 1945. After that, I suppose there's got to be a period of rebuilding, rehabilitation, uh, you know, what is that process? What does that process look like? How does Cardassia go from being completely broken and crushed in that situation to being sort of welcomed into the alpha quadrant fold at some point in the future? And I think that's a really interesting question. And, and it, you know, even in, you know, 3000 years in the future or whatever discovery is by this point, you know, does that half or quarter Cardassian president, uh, is the occupation something that she studies in school and that she's aware of and has her own thoughts about? Because she's not responsible for that. Obviously, it's, you know, like saying that, uh, well, like, you know, some people saying the Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus or whatever. It's, it's you know, a comparable kind of distance in time. But at the same time, um, that's part of her history, you know, that she may well be interested in. Yeah, it's it's interesting about, like, thinking about what they would how they would teach the occupation in the future, isn't it? Like, I mean, it, I would like to think that they teach a very accurate history <laughs> to both little Bajoran kids and little Cardassian kids. I, I, I definitely think, well, we all, we know that Cardassia joins the Federation, but I was just thinking the other day about like, um, how it would, how Cardassians would work in Starfleet. Like, would it actually work, you know? Um, just because there's so much of the, franchise we see them as just the complete opposite of starfleet they're antagonists you know to the federation and how much they are disliked and how and how aggressive they are towards uh starfleet and the federation and everything but you could say the same about the klingons i mean and yeah and we exactly had Wolf, didn't we and probably he got a bit of stick from some people but you know i mean i think that's 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 always been the case with starfleet in star trek is that they you know, have people who are the the first of their species or whatever, and they have a tough time. But gradually, that would become kind of normalised, and people get used to it, I guess. And you see in Enterprise, like you see right at the beginning of Star Trek history, that even the Vulcans, the humans, have mm. a relatively in the beginning an antagonistic relationship with, and the Vulcans have to get over their own prejudices towards humans, don't they? It's not just the human side of it; it's that the Vulcans themselves have prejudices. Um, so. I think it is possible. I think I think that um, there is some good moments at the end of Deep Space Nine where the Cardassians are still holding on to this like militaristic pride, but that they start to lose it as you know they start to lose the war and the Dominion start to decimate them and everything. And there's that moment where Damar. It's really sad where Damar learns that his wife and children have been killed, 
and he just seems so bewildered by it. Like, why? Why would? Why would they be killed? Like, they're not a target. They're they're not involved in this conflict. They have nothing to do with this. And then Kira sticks the knife in. Yeah, I mean, rather tactlessly, right? <laughs> she sort of says, "Yeah." Like, you know, who would kill innocent women and children, you know? But it is a lesson. I mean, I don't think Demar's family should have had to, should have had to die for him to learn this lesson. But <laughs> but it is a lesson for the Cardassians. I think that's sort of a sort of symbolic um, scene. There's like the less, lesson for the Cardassians that um, everybody's wives and children and families are important, you know, no matter what species they are, that no species is more um, superior than another and that... Uh, this is uh the war is always gonna be a bad thing um i guess unless you apply the just war theory <laughs> um but we can ask the questionable i suppose as well um there's also this element of like war <sighs> history belonging to the victors right um now i don't think that this completely applies to the nuremberg trials or completely applies to this situation with world war ii and the holocaust because this the Holocaust wasn't um, history interpreted some way by the victors. The Holocaust really happened. Like you know, you'll find, like you were saying about conspiracy theorists and stuff, you'll find that there are people out there who are Holocaust deniers. But it's a little bit like people who think the world is flat or who um, say that climate change isn't a real thing. They're kind of denying historical fact. They're denying. Um, scientific fact and the holocaust is historical fact you know there's plenty of evidence for it records eyewitnesses you know it's 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 it's, it's, it's history but there is um this part of the nuremberg trials where they are saying that these trials are not the purpose of vengeance they're very clearly trying to make out that this isn't the victors of a conflict writing history this is us trying to collect evidence, actual evidence, um, to to show how things happen and to, and to show who's responsible, and to show that these things did happen and they can't be denied and they they can't be misconstrued, you know. But at the same time, it's not a. I mean, this is a kind of really anachronistic point in a way, but it's not a truth and reconciliation commission. No, is it's, it? I no, mean, it's not. They no. are, and I think there is a kind of interesting question. They can't try everyone. They, they literally, the number of people they can try is limited by the number of seats in the courtroom. I mean, that's something that I didn't realise. You know, <laughs> they're basically told, okay, you've got this, this, this is how much room we've got in the dock. Uh, so you can only try the number of people that fit in there in the amount of, you, you know, and there, there are various trials, but you, you know, the logistics of it are kind of practically limited. Um, I suppose it does raise a kind of interesting question, you know, what does it mean if you choose, you know, out of, however many thousand or millions of people, I don't know how many they have in ha, have at their fingertips, if you know what I mean, uh, that you you pick as the guy in that documentary was saying, you know, I pick this one, I pick this one, I think I want an officer. I think he I said he had who did this. 7,000. Right, and he picks, you know... He picks 28. What, like... Oh, no, right, does he pick exactly. 22, I think, or 22 it's, or it's 28? It's in the 20s, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, I mean, a significant number of people, but like a, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the people that he could prosecute um and i don't think any of the ones that he was prosecuting did end up being executed but some of the kind of higher up nazis did end up being executed uh i don't know i suppose it sort of it does raise this sort of this question as lena nimoy was saying in that interview you know what is the purpose of this kind of justice what is it about is it about getting to the truth is it about a kind of symbolic almost a sort of scapegoating i suppose um is it about saying, well, practically speaking, we can't get everyone, but we're going to get some people and that that is a kind of justice or a kind of gesture in the direction of justice? Um, is it about saying, well, we can't just let everyone off the hook just because we can't get them all? And there's an interesting um, element as well, which I also wasn't that familiar with, but the the film Judgment at Nuremberg, which was made in the 1960s, leans quite heavily into, which is that by the time the Nuremberg trials were taking place, there was this whole sort of developing Cold War context. Uh, and actually there was pressure to some extent to kind of get this over with, uh, you know, deal with this issue with the Germans so we can focus on the Russians as being the, the kind of main problem going forward. And there's a line right at the end where um, 
so the American judge does sentence these various Germans uh, to life imprisonment. And someone says to him, you know, they'll be out in a few years. They're, you know, no one's going to serve a life sentence for this. Uh, just politically, that's not going to be convenient. And indeed, at the very end of the film, there's a, you know, card comes up on the screen basically saying all of these people were released within, you know, like within five years or something, I think, you know, they, they, so they, the, even the ones who served time served fairly insignificant sentences given the kind of things that they were, um, convicted of. So there is this kind of, uh, and then plus, you know, then there's the whole question of, you know, Operation Paperclip and Werner von Braun and, you, you know, the, the Nazi scientists and Nazis who were kind of brought in, uh, in other situations where their expertise was required or, or desirable. Um, so there is this kind of real question, I think, of, you know, what's the balance after a war like that? What kind of punishment is necessary? for the victims, I don't know, for society as a whole, for uh, your kind of ideas of justice. I mean, what what are the kind of repercussions? After the Dominion War, okay, they've got that one changeling in custody. Uh, they haven't got any other changelings because they're all in a kind of amorphous goo in the Gamma Quadrant and presumably they're <laughs> going to leave them well alone. Uh, I guess they've got a load of Jem'Hadar who need dealing with and they've got a bunch of Cardassians who were involved one way or another. Um I don't know what it what, what's the aftermath of that war what kind of I mean when uh Cisco is taking to cut to um this jury in Waltz this is because he's going you know they have him in custody and the intention is to try him after the war is over which is interesting they don't try him while the war is happening they've obviously decided that that would be sort of inappropriate somehow but that you can't deal with war crimes until the war itself is dealt with I don't know whether that's because in the midst of war, you'll be too prejudiced against the person or, or, or you, you know, what, what that uh, rationale is, though it sort of, sort of seems to make sense intuitively. Um, but, you know, are there other prisoners who've been held who are waiting for the war to end before they get their kind of day in court? And, and what is, what is that process under Federation law? It would be interesting to kind of know more about it. And I mean, we've talked about a few episodes in this podcast um and i think it's interesting that deep space nine is the series that touches on these issues and kind of invokes the nuremberg trials and the eichmann trial uh but i suppose we don't really ever get to see one of these trials i mean the closest we get is in waltz uh to cut basically get cisco to put him on trial on that horrible planet do you know what i mean we we sort of get a weird version of a trial but it's not a very i don't think it would stand up legally i mean cisco is like leading to cut constantly to cut is clearly insane and therefore probably has limited a capacity to uh conduct his defense let alone you know whether he's responsible for his actions at that point um you know there's there's a lot of uh that that's sort of the closest we get to actually seeing one of these trials um take place in a way I also think these trials are like war crimes, human rights, um, war of aggression, the crime of aggression, you know, like the big crime of like basically waging an unjust illegal war and everything. I think these trials are so more complicated than a trial, uh, other kind of criminal trials. And I think part of it is because of the emotion involved. Every time I've seen one of these trials, these trials dramatized, or I've seen like documentary footage of these trials, even though people are trying, the prosecutors and the defense are trying their best to be as legally um, sound as possible, you know, or I guess objective, uh, there's always emotion in it, you know, there's always this sort of strong emotion in it because how could you be objective in the face of such terrible crimes like how could you be and um because they're such big public widespread crimes because they affect so much of life and so many aspects of life and because they affect so many people it's just like it's such a serious and um big endeavor that it doesn't seem like it could be ever be without strong emotion do you know what i mean so it's it's not like it's not like you're just um 
And I mean, I, 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 I mean, I know there's strong emotion in lots of different criminal trials. You know, like it, it, the crime can be a much smaller scale crime, but it can be it can be very devastating, right? Um, so I know that it's hard to prosecute um, or to, to have criminal trials for almost any crime, but this just seems like so much more at stake. You know, it seems such so much bigger. It's like it's like it's going to go down in history. And the thing that really interested me about Duet. They really made me stop and think about it for a second. Was Maritza, and I know he's trying to like bait Kira, and he's being unpleasant. But he says, "Kill me, torture me. It doesn't matter. You've already lost. You can never undo what I've accomplished. The dead will still be dead." And there's something kind of like true about that, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, even if he was brought, if he was actually Gull Dahil, and he was brought to Bejor, and it was proved that he had committed these crimes and it was proved that he was guilty and he was executed would that really bring Kira any peace you know would that really get rid of the images that she saw when she um, liberated Galatep do you know what I mean like you can see when she's talking about Galatep about just how truly awful it was um, it's not going to bring any of those people back and those survivors of Galatep that were kind of communing outside Odo's um, office, you know, this kind of haunted figures sort of draped in, in, in like, um, I don't know, like robes or kind of looks like rags, to be honest, um, sort of silently standing there. I mean, are their lives going to become better because of this? I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't hold people accountable and responsible and that we shouldn't prosecute them and that they shouldn't face, you know, justice, um, but the fact of the matter is that um, it's not going to change history. And what would be good would be um, if there was things in place that acted as a deterrent for people to commit these crimes in the future. Hmm. And something like the International Criminal Court, you know, existing, where people are prosecuted for these crimes um, so that the point where, you know, when world leaders decide they're going to invade a neighbouring country, mentioning no names, or when leaders uh, decide they're going to test chemical weapons on their own population, or they're going to uh, target an gr- a ethnic group in their own society and, and persecute them, that they think twice about this because they think, well, actually legally there's too many eyes in the world watching me do this and if i'm found out uh, there's too much evidence of me doing this everybody's watching me the world the eyes of the world are on me and i can't get away with this i can't do it in the dark and someday i could be taken to the international criminal court and i could be prosecuted for these crimes and the problem is the international criminal court is not strong enough it doesn't have enough teeth and that's because some of the biggest nations in the world have not signed up to it Uh, partly because i think they think their own leaders and their own soldiers and their own Military could be could be um, prosecuted for things that they've done. It, I guess it, I guess the thing is you want a deterrent, you know. And I don't know if hanging gold or heel in Bajor was going to be a deterrent to any Cardassian or any other species across the universe, you know, mm. across the Star Trek universe, Star Trek galaxy. What does it achieve, sort of thing? Yeah, I'm not saying that gold or heel shouldn't have been brought to justice, but like Odo was saying, there's many of them out there. I think it also, it partly depends on your views about capital punishment, probably. I mean, my feeling is that, I don't know, I I think it's very tricky because I I think there are people in a situation like that who not only deserve to be brought to justice, but probably don't deserve to be alive, if you know what I mean. But I don't necessarily think that killing them makes things better for anyone else. Do you know what I mean? And I think actually, I mean, the Eichmann trial is an interesting example of that because, you know, uh, and, and I think it's a key reference point, not just because of the the glass booth, which was the kind of bulletproof uh, box that he sat in, which is the kind of iconography that uh, the, the kind of visual iconography that translates into the man in the glass booth. And then, uh, you know, obviously doesn't visually translate to duet, although you do have all these scenes with him in a holding cell, which is kind of like a glass booth. I suppose you could say there's, maybe there's an echo of that there, but, um, you you know, this was a trial that, I mean, when you think of it, you you sort of alluded to 
the idea of these trials as being quite different to other kind of criminal trials and so on. And I think that's true. Do we expect an element of kind of courtroom drama, especially if we're dramatising and fictionalising these stories, do we expect them to play out in a certain way? Um, the Eichmann trial was televised around the world uh, in quite, you know, cutting edge ways. There were various cameras around the courtroom, uh, you know, and footage coming out every day and a camera on him in close up throughout the trial. So you can watch him reacting. I mean, he doesn't, he is weirdly impassive a lot of the time. He doesn't react as much as you might think, uh, which I think is interesting in terms of this idea of emotion. You know, where is the, where is the emotion? He's not getting emotional as the defendant. He's actually extremely kind of cool, sort of chillingly cool and kind of, uh, unflappable. There is emotion from the prosecutors. And I think, this kind of comes back to this idea of, you know, Kira saying it has to be a Bajoran who interrogates Dar- Daril or Maritza, whoever it is. It has to be a Bajoran who does this. It has to be a Jew who, you know, an Israeli Jew who prosecutes um, the Eichmann. And there's a very powerful, um, you know, you can watch, because it's all filmed, you can watch the, the proceedings of the trial. And the prosecutor makes this speech in the opening where he says... Um, it's not just me prosecuting you. There are six million, you know, victims basically of the Holocaust are all prosecuting you as well, which is very emotive, very powerful, very moving speech. On the other hand, I suppose it does raise this question, you know, in what courtroom is the victim allowed to be the prosecution? Do you know what I mean? There is supposed to be uh, a separation between that, isn't there? The, pr- the prosecutor is not supposed to be personally, um, tied to the case and if they were found to be tied to the case they'd probably be expected to recuse themselves but obviously in a situation like this um it's inevitable it's kind of baked into that situation that that they are the ones bringing the charges they are the ones who want and they want to do it you know um israel wants to be the ones to put this guy on trial to the extent that they have to capture and kidnap him and get him you know, to their country where they can control the proceedings and do that because for whatever kind of emotional, cathartic, healing uh, reason, they need to be the ones to do that. It wouldn't be enough to hand him over to some other court and say, okay, you know, you're more objective, you're more neutral, you're less emotional in this situation, you deal with it. It's actually seen as, you know, necessary for that process to have whatever kind of healing uh, effect it's supposed to have for them to be the ones doing it. And Kira, as I say, sort of, I think is kind of making the same argument, really. Yeah, I guess the issue is that the Holocaust is illegal, right? It's it's a, it's mm-hmm. crimes against humanity. It's It's mass murder, which is crimes against humanity. It's also war crimes, you know, in a war situation, you don't go and mass slaughter people <laughs> that's that's a that's a war crime um and obviously war crimes are much more when they're prosecu- people are prosecuted for them it's war crimes are more for like individuals although you can prosecute um people who are um senior uh orchest- or orchestrators of, uh, of 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 such a thing but um whereas crimes against humanity are much more state level crimes um, war crimes are uh, soldiers carrying out the orders of states, right? And 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 uh, crimes against humanity are are crimes that are um, sort of like state policy. But of course, you can try individuals for that too. Like you know, you could try Hitler for war, uh, crimes against humanity because he's the one that devised these the final solution, or at least worked with other people to devise the final solution. Um, but the problem with this is like. The Holocaust is an illegal thing, right? It, 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 in Nazi Germany, I guess they they made up these laws. They, the, the the laws against the Jews were were laws in in their eyes, but it's like you want to be the total opposite of that. You want to be the total opposite of like the lawlessness of massacring people. You want to be as um, on the side of the angels, shall we say? I, I I don't know how any other way to put it. So although these 
client, these, these criminal trials are going to be so emotional. Of course they are, because these are horrible things we're talking about. Um, and devastating crimes. You want to try and be objective if you can. And I would include the death penalty. And I don't think the state should have the right to, to execute people, even if they are terrible, terrible war criminals. Because people who are being accused of this were executing people under the name of the state. You know, I mean, the final solution was a, was, was, was a, a Nazi state policy. You know, so a little bit like you're, you're, and you could say, well, you want to be a better than that, right? I think the different, the the key difference though is that there, those those people have not been accused of doing anything wrong. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not, I'm not in favour of the death penalty, but at the same time, I do think there's a difference between exterminating civilians and committing genocide, of course, and executing a prisoner who's been there tried and found guilty. And, do you, do I you don't know what think I mean? the state I'm not, should I'm ever not saying be allowed I think to kill either anybody. of those is right, but there's because a massive, I, I think the problem with that is you go down that route, uh, gap then between the two. you're going down a route that's very dark. Like because if, sure. if the state can execute people, then what the state believes is the right changes depending on mm. the politicians of the day, of the regime of the time. Like, you know, I mean, and um, and and what people determine is a crime that's worth killing people for. Um, like as in uh, a crime that's, that's worth executing. Do you know what I mean? Like as in that would be the penalty for that crime or whatever. I mean, also, we, we live and, and you know, uh, grown up and lived in a country that uh, in our lifetimes has not, executed people you, you know where that that has been uh it is it's no longer a kind of a, a legal um punishment on the other hand uh you know people often say every time they do a poll the majority of british people are in favor of capital punishment and would bring it back and it's only you know because the politicians don't want to uh deal with that that it hasn't happened i mean it could happen again in the future. Do you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, you, you know, you and I uh, and the British law and the Federation are all on the same page here. Uh, but, you know, America and the Bajorans and the <laughs> Britain up to the 1950s are, are on the other side. And it's not, um, they're not kind of, a- any of these things could change. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, I guess if the death penalty was going to be the crime, going to be the punishment for the crime, then mm. I think that the war criminal should be prosecuted in an entirely neutral environment, like the mm. International Criminal Court. With, I think you got if 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 the ultimate ultimate penalty is death for that individual, um, if they're proven guilty, then the trial has to be as objective as possible. You know, and it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. Now, Eichmann, it was beyond reasonable doubt they knew it was him, right? But in some of these other cases that we've been talking about, this mistaken identity or the identities are confused or it's so long after the crime was committed that these people have hidden themselves and are they really say who they are? All the records have all been destroyed. I mean, one of the things that Kira mentions in Duet is that the Cardassians destroyed all their records before they left, right? So when they get that picture of of Maritza, and, you know, gold or heel, it's been altered and they wouldn't know. They're, they're basically, what they're doing is relying on a caption of a photo to identify him. Plus a bit of kind of magic Blade Runner style uh, image enhancement. Well, we, yeah, that was hilarious. She was, I, was <laughs> I like, love that. It goes oh, around the corner. That's not really. how it works. You don't <laughs> zoom in a photo and become sharper. Um, <laughs> but see, that's part of the problem that I have. And I mean, this isn't necessarily um, the exact same situation, but there have been cases in the US where people have been executed for crimes and then been found to have been innocent of them. Um, It's a very definite punishment. It's a very definite end. You can't release somebody from death where you can release them from prison if you've made some sort of error in the judicial system. And also, if the ultimate penalty is death, then you have to assume your judicial system is without any fault in any crime for uh, in, sorry in any trial for any crime M- mass murder or you know just plain old first degree murder you know like you have to you have to assume that your judicial system is without fault and the people in the judici- judici- judicial system are going to be without fault and i just i just don't believe that human beings are capable of being without fault in in any criminal trial to be honest i think we try as much as we can but there's always going to be bias or mistakes or eyewitness testimony that's unreliable or um 
t- legal loopholes or mistake or misplaced evidence or you know people could lie on the stand i mean there's a whole range of things that can happen you know you, and i think that people's interpretation of the law can be different um so i just think like the death penalty is but also you're giving the state the power to execute people. And I think giving the state the power to execute people means that you're starting to edge into a situation where, I mean, who's to say what they they could do in the future? <laughs> I just think it's dangerous. I think it's really dangerous. Sure. Um, but I, yeah, I agree with you that these people deserve more than just five years in prison. Like, and and the idea that, people are prosecuted for such terrible, terrible crimes, spend five years in prison and then are let out because the political climate changes is a horrifying idea. You know, you you are like the sort of designer of of a system or, or a policy that eradicated people's lives and destroyed people's lives and you only get five years in prison for it? That's kind of horrifying too. Um, so... You know, I mean, really, I've always thought that if somebody had done something like this, they should spend the rest of their lives in a very small cell with very little to occupy their minds. I think that's torture as well, I guess. <laughs> I mean, should we be torturing people? That's another that's another podcast. But I mean, there's this idea of like cruel and unusual, was it cruel and unusual punishment that's not supposed to be allowed, right? But you want to be the better side right you want to be the better person so you want to be able to treat these people better than they treated other people but it's very hard if they are um if they've committed such serious horrible crimes and there are um survivors of 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 those crimes still alive and demanding justice yeah absolutely i mean i think it's very tricky to know what the what the right punishment is for someone in these situations. Um, And, you know, we're looking at them with the benefit of more than half a century of hindsight in all these cases as well. Um, But they are certainly interesting trials and they raise interesting questions, I think, about our ideas about guilt and responsibility and so on. I also think just maybe as a kind of final point, there's an interesting element that comes across when you look at some of these fictionalized stories about these trials and that's about the kind of personality that's put on trial um famously eichmann the eichmann trial uh hannah arendt wrote a book about the eichmann trial uh and she coined this uh concept of the banality of evil um and that what was shocking about eichmann was that he didn't seem like a monster he didn't seem evil if you know what i mean he didn't seem even like hitler ranting and raving um he seemed like a very kind of boring banal uh you know like a kind of middle manager like a um you know a a sort of unimpressive person if you know what i mean and he was you know obsessed with his railway timetables or whatever he was good at the logistics and so on but he's just a very sort of unimpressive person and i think it's it brings up this interesting idea of what do we expect these evil monsters to be like? What sort of people do we expect them to be? Do we expect them to be like Hitler or, you know, um, Saddam Hussein or you know, these kind of larger than life uh, dictator type characters? And the people who operate underneath them often aren't like that at all. Even the people at the top aren't necessarily like that. Um, but, you know, how do we kind of handle that? And I think there's this tension with these stories. I mean, Maritza really is, whether he's evil or not, uh, is is tied into the banality of evil because he's literally, he's a filing clerk. Do you know what I mean? He's You can't get more mundane and banal than that. And that's kind of the point. And there's this kind of question of, you know, the way Maritza as Daryl talks about Maritza as Maritza is exactly the same kind of contemptuous attitude that uh, Hannah Arendt has in a way for Eichmann, you know, that he's this rather pathetic sort of unimpressive man. He's not, uh, he's not the villain that they almost expect or want or need him to be. And I think there's this interesting element in all these stories of the kind of the banal versus the grandiose and, and, and this performance of grandiosity. So I've always thought as much as, 
duet, I think is a fantastic episode and an amazing story. And frankly, better than the man in the glass booth, I would say, as a piece of storytelling. Um, there's something about the performance of Harris Eulin, who plays Maritza slash Daryl, that I've always found a little bit off-putting. And what it is, and this is not to say that I don't think he's brilliant, because I think he is, but it's when he is sort of performing the villain and like hamming it up a bit. Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's hamming it up more than we used to with Cardassians. We don't normally get that. If you think of like Descartes, as I say, generally quite restrained, Garrick, very kind of uh, cool and, and sly. Um, this kind of hammy, uh, villainous acting and this kind of ranting and saying, you know, ah, uh, it was nothing but a day's work. It's, it, it's all, it's all quite in that register. And it's interesting watching the man in the glass booth because it's exactly the performance that he gives, uh, as the kind of Nazi, uh, you know, commandant or whatever. So, so we've seen him play in the first half of the movie, this, uh, Jewish character, this Jewish rich, New York, uh, Jew, basically. Um, uh, this, this rich Jew living in, in New York who's made a lot of money and so on. Um, and he's quite eccentric and grandiose in his own way. And then in the second half, he plays this kind of ranting, raving, uh, sort of nasty Nazi. Um, but it's very much a performance and it's over the top and it's kind of, uh, that, that sort of deliberate element of it. And it just kind of strikes me with these stories that we have this need to push the banal, mundane criminal in the direction of the kind of grandiose, over-the-top criminal. And even with someone like Ducat, that's kind of what we get in Waltz, and that's kind of what Cisco is goading him towards, is to, like, show his true, you know, as you say, racist, violent, nasty side. Do you know what I mean? Say what you really think. And what he ends up with is this kind of raving, I should have killed all of them and I'm going to turn their planet into a graveyard the galaxy's never seen. And and this kind of real, like, you know, he goes full on sort of Khan level of of deranged villainy. Um, and, and there's this big question throughout Waltz of, is Descartes mad or is he bad? You know, is he recovered from his madness as he claims he has? Uh, or is he sort of faking a recovery? Obviously, we discover he's hallucinating. Um with a lot of these stories, I think there's this kind of question of madness hanging over them. I mean, the man in the glass booth, uh, what is, uh, you know, it, it's not as in duet, a kind of scheme that makes any kind of rational sense. It's a kind of, it does seem like a sort of a madness. What a split personality. It's not quite clear what's going on, but, but clearly some kind of derangement is happening for him. And I would say even in duet, there's an element of, um, it's not a totally rational kind of plan that he's carrying out. There's, there's a kind of, certainly even in the performance, at least there's a kind of madness to it. So I suppose there's this kind of question, you know, do we dramatically, do we demand that in our courtroom dramas, our villains are not banal and boring like Eichmann, but are kind of grandstanding and, and grandiose? Uh, and also, do we somehow require them to be insane uh, in order to understand them or to kind of put them in a box rather than them being totally rational and calm and collected and kind of able to explain themselves in their own terms. Do you know what I mean? Is there a, a kind of dramatic tendency to ham up the performance and also to sort of almost say that you can't be that bad and be tied into all those things without also having to some extent, lost your mind. The guy in the darkness and the light would be the other uh, obvious example of that. You, you know, he he also has a kind of split personality. He's, you know, he, when he's in the shadows, he, he's he got a sort of golem thing going on, hasn't he, where he's talking about the creature and, and all this stuff. Uh, you, you know, it's not enough to have this character just be wounded by the, uh, the circumstance of the occupation and exacting revenge. He has to be mad as well. Yeah, I think that you either want them to be super repentant you know like really really sorry for what they've done or we want them to basically be these terrible terrible racists you know um or, or like terrible terrible prejudiced people who are like oh but Jorans are lazy and stupid and they deserve to die uh we, we can't really i think dramatically cope with the idea that they are just very banal 
Or that they're keeping their own counsel. I mean, I suppose maybe that's the thing that's so shocking about Eichmann is this kind of refusal to say, you know, when he's, he says this is a matter for my own conscience, basically it's none of your business uh, what I thought about this mass murder that I was wrapped up in. Do you know what I mean? It's this, I think you're right. We want them to go one way or the other. We want them to emote. We want them to either feel really bad about it or be totally unrepentant and and horrific in such a way that we can feel angry with them. I don't know, this kind of Otherwise, refusal there's no catharsis. to go either way. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lack of catharsis. Um, there's just this kind of blank. And interestingly, I actually think the Cardassians are more of the banal. Like if you think about Damar, if you just think about how like no criticism to anybody who likes Damar as a character, but there is a banal aspect to him. You know, like he does carry out orders. He looks weary throughout most of the Dominion War. Like, uh, like he gets angry and frustrated about things. But like, do you know what I mean? I do sort of feel like with the whole Cardassian military society and structure, the sort of kind of Cardassian military machine, the, I could see that a lot of the Cardassians would just be going out and carrying out orders. There's a huge bureaucracy, isn't there? It feels like there's an enormous amount of like, there is a lot of filing and a lot of like, you know, and even all the kind of spy stuff and so on. It, yeah, it it feels very kind of bureaucratic and elaborate and sort of um, tedious in some ways. And there is a bit of an element to Garrick like that. Like, I mean, Garrick is a very um, compelling character, partly because he is so interesting and like, sort of sinisterly charming and stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like he is kind of, he's much, he's an animated compelling character. He's not, he's not banal, but there are things that he states quite matter of factly mm-hmm. without any sort of passionate emotion to them. Like that's just the way things are in Cardassia or that's, that's what happens when you work for the Obsidian Order. You know, like things happen and things take place and things need to happen and things are structured this way. And it's almost like it's just a given, like it's not, do you know what I mean? Like, and the one thing where they all become passionate, every single Cardassian, I think, with the exception of maybe Maritza, even Maritza, is in their in their love for the homeland, in their love for Cardassia. So, like, that's something that Garrick's very passionate about. Ducat is obviously obsessed about Cardassian glory and the glory of Cardassia. Damar it does a lot of things for Cardassia. Um, in including joining forces with Kira, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And uh, and including like fighting his own people, and even Maritza. For Maritza, is like I'm doing it for Cardassia. There's an element in the Cardassian psyche that is a it's a little bit not even about the Bajorans. It's about them, you know, and a little 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 sort of like I don't know collective egotism. And with Zakat, everything's about him. So even in Waltz you know, that it's not really about whether or not he's guilty of war crimes. It's about whether or not, like, Cisco um, respects sort him. of will condemn him. Mm, yeah. yeah, Cisco will respect him. To the point where I was watching it, I was like, oh, it's a cat. Like, this isn't about you. This is about all the people that died during the occupation. <laughs> the poor Bajorans who died, the victims. It's not really... And I guess you could say that about Eichmann, right? It's not really about the Jews. Like, it's, it's about myself and how I feel about myself and what I... And there's a... When you're there's that level of egotism, how could you ever respect anyone else? How could you ever care about anyone else? How could you ever, I don't know, worry about anyone else if it's all about you? Do you know what I mean? So maybe it's the egotism that's the problem, not so much the sort of like, I don't know, crazy hysterical sort of angst antics in these in these you know the sort of ranting and raving and mm, the, the theatrics, um, you know, it, it, theatrics of the story. Yeah, maybe it's the me, me, me of it all. I don't know. Like, it's, it, it was interesting at one point when Maritza was like, let me ask you some questions to Kira. Because I was like, oh, really? Are you sure you want to do that? Because you seem to be pretty in love of talking about yourself. <laughs> you know, like, um, but with Jakarta, it's definitely that way. And it is all, for most Cardassians, it's all about Cardassia. And even Cardassians who aren't involved in the military, like the Cardassian scientists and stuff, you know, that we see. It's very, very proud to be Cardassian. And maybe the Cardassian people could be taken down a peg or two. Um, it's, a, it's a supremacist kind of culture, right? Well, it's like a kind of extreme nationalism, isn't it? That they're all very yeah. much 
yeah uh bound up in in the same way as you could say you know maybe the germans had the you, you know there, there's a kind of echo of that and, and a lot of countries obviously have that in various ways but i think you're right all the cardassians that we see are very pro cardassia whatever they think uh being pro cardassia means it's interesting when you were talking about it, it being all me 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 um when i was looking at the ds9 companion uh section on duet one of the things that came up was ira stephen bear talking about this idea of the great cardassian monologue and that basically cardassians like to talk and they like to give them these these sort of epic monologues that the actors can kind of really get their teeth into and he was saying with that episode we spent the whole time uh you know ira was like improvising these speeches and the other guy was writing them down and so on and they kind of that's how they ended up with the script for these things but i just thought it's quite interesting this idea that the cardassians love the sound of their own voice and certainly with Ducat, uh you get that kind of uh in spades isn't there that book that garrick recommends to bashir the never-ending sacrifice yeah. yeah it's like that right it's like the and and doesn't bashir just be like it just repeats itself over and over like mm. what was the point and the guy was uh, garrick was sort of saying like oh it's to do with like the guy's commitment to cardassia or something or i can't remember the details of it um i'm sure i'm sure our listeners can can tell us but um there is an element of cardassian society like that right like this just like endless monologue <laughs> Of like we're the most important species in the room and <laughs> we love ourselves um to the point where it, you don't find that with the dominion in the same way i mean the dominion definitely think they're the most important species in the room but um well then the changelings do but the you know i mean like the the vorta it's all about in service to to, the, to their god to their specific their supposed gods right it's a bit different i feel like I feel like the Cardassian gods would be Cardassians. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Descartes was really cheated of his day in court. I think he would have loved his appearance before the um, Federation jury. They would have needed, <laughs> yeah. like in the man in the glass booth, the judge points out he's got a mute button. Uh, <laughs> they would have needed to use that, I think, to shut him up now and then. Uh, but yeah, he would he would probably have made the most of that situation. But what would they have done with him, though, if they found him guilty? That's the question. Because the Federation are trying him, right? It's not the Bajorans. He, he, yeah, he, he would did. get sent to a penal he colony a, or something. Yeah, exactly. And uh, probably escape uh, a few years later, I don't know, to <laughs> wreak havoc again. But who knows? Sadly, that's not uh, that's not the way things went uh, for Takat. He ended up drowning in a fire cave or whatever instead. Um, but, Clara, it's been, as ever, a pleasure um, talking to you about these rather dark but fascinating um subjects if our <laughs> listeners want to hear more from you or get in touch with you and let you know uh their thoughts on some of these issues or or maybe raise a slightly cheerier topic what's the best way for them to do that um so you can find me on twitter at clara jean mc i also run a podcast about women and gender in film television and um and fiction called the tales we tell and you can find that on twitter at the tales podcast uh it's also available on like spotify apple podcasts where you get your podcast basically you're blended all right the concept is based on the fact that the israelis picked up eichmann after the second world war and brought him to israel to try him for war crimes uh, against the Jewish people. And uh, here we have a story about a man who was picked up in New York, a very successful Jewish businessman, picked up in New York and brought to Israel to be tried for war crimes as uh, as a, uh, a member of the Einsatz Group and the mobile killing unit of the SS. And the question is, is he or is he not this Colonel Dorf that they claim that he is, that they put on trial here? And during the course of the trial, I think we begin to wonder whether or not this trial should ever have taken place. And whether or not trials of this kind really mean anything, and what do they really say? What is what? What are these trials for? Is it a way of people getting their emotions out, or is it really justice? You see, these are some of the questions that are raised. And while I understand the need for these trials, I too wonder what do they really accomplish? What do they really say? Finally, 
right, you see. And, and would we not find ourselves in similar circumstances uh, if the roles were reversed? And would we not say, well, we, we shouldn't be tried because we were the right guys? And who are the right guys? And what is right? You know, these are some of the very exciting questions that this play attempts to deal Obviously, with. Obviously, it's going to be a challenging experience for yes. the audience. Yes, I think it is. It's going, to, it's going to make people sit up and say, wow. <laughs> you know? And I think in a very exciting way. I don't think it's the kind of play that pounds... Uh, pounds a message at people or, or preaches a message at people, which is what I like about it. I think it's done in such a theatrical way that one can't help but be fascinated by the proceedings while one is wondering, you know, what are the answers to is some of a little bit questions. of fascination of the Cobra? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's that kind of dangerous fascination. Exactly. Exactly. Are you... Um are you pleased that I didn't ask you a single question about your point of view? <laughs> <laughs> now you did. <laughs> no, that's all right. I don't mind. I, I've been asked about my point of view many, many times, and I've gotten used to that as being the, the element that first brought me to broad public attention. And I think that, that in most cases, public personalities start with some kind of a, of a specific characteristic, whether it's a voice or whether it's the ears or whether it's a way of walking or Jimmy Cagney with his... With his, you know, voice and his belt business and stuff. Well, it certainly was a memorable characterization in Star Trek, which, of course, is still on reruns. We run yeah. it every Saturday yeah. evening here. It's still very popular, and I'm very proud of it. 